So we got our radius right there. So we need the length. So we got the length labeled, we just don't have the uh, computation for it. So let's go ahead and get that right now. So do I have a function of x or y? We got a dy integral, so I need to write it as g prime of y. So my length function is a function of y. That was determined before when we determined our uh, integral was a dy integral. So good news is we have a function of y already. So this is our g of y right here. All I need to do is take derivative. That's the easiest derivative. Gy one minus y. Now when you write g y prime or g prime y, what derivative derivative with respect to what variable? X or y? This will be with respect to y right here, and you can see it happen. The derivative with respect to the input variable usually. So when you write prime, it's with respect to whatever your input is. All right, g prime negative one. All right, that's the nicest derivative we'll probably have in a length function. So we got negative 1 squared, which is square root 2. So that's our length. Why does it make sense for this length to be a constant? Does it matter where I am up here for how big that um, length is? So it should be the same angle the whole time, so it should be the same length the whole time. Now where does that point 2 come from? Geometrically, I used a really, really big marker. So I'll just go th think about this. What that actually measures is we have a dy integral, so we can't use that vertical amount as the length. So that square root 2 tells you how that measurement, that vertical measurement, relates to the actual length that we're trying to find. And that length is square root two times longer than the uh, part that I drew, right there. You get that Pythagorean theorem. Just go, we go one, one. This one will be square root two. Now, of course, that isn't one. This will be dy. Uh, so that's dy, and that square root two, dy, basically. So it's just scaled, scaled down. So anytime you're not dealing with a straight line, the amount of y that you go is going to have a different amount of length as you're going across. So that's why it's not generally constant. In this particular example, it is. So throw this together in the formula, which is here. So we have a dy, so we're using the second version. And I didn't write out the generic one here, so let's go ahead and do that right now. So this is generic. That'll work either way. No matter what, you have 2 pi, a to b, r, l. So if you want to save some space on your cheat sheet, this will work as long as you know r and you know l. So if you feel comfortable going with more general one, you can just write this one. You just have to know how to get R and how to get L. There's two ways to get L, and they're both written inside these square roots. So those are the two ways to get L. And if you've done enough length problems from the previous section, you can probably just leave it like this. And you'll know, look at L, and that's the L you were using before. So it doesn't come out of nowhere. So that L is linked right before to the length that you compute there. So if this is right next to your arc length, formula, you probably can leave it like this right here. You'll know what your L is. So service area 2 pi R L. So R is 2 minus Y. L is just square root 2. We can have a dy. And what about A and B? What are our minimum maximum Y values? You look at our original drawing. Going 0 to 1. On, we're going on the y-axis. So these are y0 to y1. So 
So if I finish this integral, it, would, it should insult your intelligence. That's the easiest antiderivative I think we've had all quarter. And that is the last arc length problem we're going to do. So there's a lot less things to worry about <laughs> arc length. That's the last surface area problem we're going to do. So there's a lot less things to worry about with surface area. And I strongly recommend you do 6.3, the arc length section, and then come in and do the surface area. It'll be a lot easier to go that way. So the last section in chapter six is work. And we've done some work problems before, and we'll talk about what they were, and then how these work problems are going to differ from what you've done before. So we've done this in pre-calculus class, and you've taken any physics class, you should have uh, computed some work in there as well. So the work of a constant force, I'll go constant force of F in the direction of movement. So that means that the force is pushing the exact same direction that the movement's happening. So they're parallel. The work is the force times the, uh, the distance or the displacement. So you just multiply them together. In pre-calculus class, we also did problems where the force, so in this world, the force and the direction have to be parallel. In pre-calculus, we did problems where the force and the movement were not parallel. And that turned into a dot product back then. You will do, in the future, you will compute work where your force is not parallel with your direction of movement, but that gets into multivariable calculus. So we're not going to do that right now. What we are going to do is not have a constant force. So our force won't be the same amount the entire time. And because our force is not going to be constant, we need to compute this a little bit differently. So this was all before for calculus. So now force is still parallel. To the displacement. But our force uh, is going to change over time. So the force is not constant. And it's going to change. You could write a change over time problem, but we'll write it as changing over an x, uh, different x values. So this changes over different x values. So that means force is really a function of x. So we'll write force as a function now. And our displacement is going to be, we're going to travel over the x-axis, so it's going to be big value minus small value. And this is the length of the interval from A to B. Now the reason I put absolute value over the B minus A because sometimes you may want to move to the left instead of to the right. So sometimes uh, B might be the smaller value, not the bigger value. So you want to go and take the absolute value. All right, so our work 
we're going to integrate from a to b f of x dx. Now where does the displacement go? There's no actual uh, displacement. It's not times regular d. The displacement is taken care of by traveling across the interval right here. So the displacement is taken care of right here on how far you're going to go on your x-axis from what x value to what other x value. Yes, sir. No, it's just notation. I think usually when people write force diagrams, they'll write like capital F1, capital F2 for not any particular reason other than other people write it like that. So there's our work, how, to, how we're going to compute work. So now we're going to need some physics laws. So we'll look at Hooke's law for springs. Is there an E in hooks? Yeah. I thought so. Does that make it like hooks or something like that? So here's hooks law, the force. To displace. A spring x distance is proportional are proportional. So force to displace a spring x distance so the force f to displace a spring x distance this is not a good English sentence Yeah. Two displaced spring x distance are proportional All right, so proportional doesn't mean equal. It means there, if you multiply a constant by one, you'll get the other. So that's what it means to be proportional. So that constant we'll just call A. A we'll call it K, where K is the spring constant. So every spring has its own constant. It's basically measuring how resistant the metal is or whatever material to being bent. So if you take your pen apart, you can probably bend the spring, uh, shrink the spring, or increase the spring very easily because it's meant to be with your thumb. You just click. But if you look at a garage door spring or a spring from a suspension, you probably couldn't compress a suspension spring unless you use some type of press or something like that. So it's not going to move under human forces, generally. Um, and a garage door spring is kind of in the middle. You could move it a little bit if you worked really hard, but you're not going to double the length of a garage door spring by hand. Really, you certainly shouldn't try. Um, so there are very different types of springs out there, from really weak ones to really strong ones. And this just relates how much force you have to apply to uh, change the length of that spring. Of course, slinkies are springs, too, uh, that have a very, very low constant. They're very easy to change the uh, length of those springs. Um, is x l minus l naught the initial length minus the length inside the stretch from compressed? Yeah, so this x is really a displacement right there. So. We have to be very careful about that. So let's draw a spring right there. So let's say this is the what they call the natural length. What that means is, if you think of a slinky or something with a really low, uh, a really small k, 
uh, if you hold a slinky up, you'll be actually, its own weight extends the slinky. So if you want to measure the natural length, it has to be either in a zero gravity environment or perfectly lying on a flat surface sideways. So it doesn't have any uh, forces going in the, along its axis, basically. The displacement is how far away from the natural length the spring is. So you can have a positive displacement if you're stretching and a negative displacement if you're compressing. So there's natural length. So here it would be, so this would be displacement right there. Or you could compress the spring. And then what was missing would be the displacement. And I'm using. Uh, if it's the same spring, it's the same constant. So this would be a positive displacement, and this would be down here a negative displacement. So it can go either way. And your displacement zero, that means the spring is not, uh, has no forces acting on it, or it's a length that would be if no forces were acting on it. So displacement's a little tricky. It's not the length. It's how far away from the standard length that the spring is at the moment. And that's really important to understand because that would mess up things up later. So our first example. Circular springs? Okay. No, every spring is a straight line. Except the ones that aren't. <laughs> Spring from one foot to three fourths feet if k equals sixteen pounds per foot. I don't think you need to know the natural length of the spring to answer this question. So let's see if we can do it without that information. I don't think that we need it here. Now because I don't know the natural length, we still need to use uh, the natural length to apply Hooke's law. It uses a natural length. So I'm going to use L to be the natural length. Now, just to warn you, if you write this, what's wrong? What's misleading if I use my L, the standard L that you're probably writing down? It looks like a 1. So then I don't want to assume that length is 1. So use a cursive L when you're writing math, and you want to have an L variable, or else you're going to, or a capital L, or else you're going to have problems. So, so we know two lengths of the spring, but I don't need the lengths of the spring. I need the displacement of the spring. So how do I take one foot, the and the natural length, and get displacement? So let's go up to this right here. So we'll call that natural length L, just renaming these things. Here is, we'll say this is one foot now. And let's write all this stuff in green. So let's say that this length right here is one. So that's the one foot right there. Oh, we're already assuming the natural length is longer. Thank you. 
Seems like that's what's implied. And would, uh, so I, I'm just worried that uh, <coughs> if the natural length was bigger than one foot, it would be, that would change things. If it was smaller than a foot, that would also change things. Uh, that would make the displacement, the one foot displacement positive or negative, basically. So let's, let's make that assumption that the length that it's at the uncompressed length at one foot. Oh, we still need displacement at one foot. All right, natural length is one foot. What is the displacement at one foot? Zero. That's really important. The displacement at one foot is not one. The displacement at one foot is zero. So if you use a one there, you're going to have some problems. All right, displacement at 3 fourths feet. What's that? A quarter foot. Should it be 1 fourth foot positive or 1 fourth foot negative? So if we're stretching, it should be positive. If we're compressing, it's going to be negative. So it'll be 1 minus uh, 3 fourths, which is, oh, no. Should be the other way around. All right, so we're going to go from 0 to negative 1 fourth. And our force equals kx, so force equals 16x. That's our force. And work is the integral. Let's go d1 to d2, displacement 1 to displacement 2, 16x dx. And we said our first displacement is 0 to negative 1 fourth. So we get 8x squared from 0 to 1 fourth, negative 1 fourth. Now there's some units in here. So if we do a unit analysis, we're measuring in, so our k is in feet. So 16 was measured in feet, no, pounds per foot. Yeah, pounds per foot. Uh, X, that is a distance, is measured in feet. Now, when you do an integral, there's an invisible dimension that creeps in. And that dimension is basically how you measure the axis, the, what is the measurement or the units on the axis you're going to go across. So what is that measurement right there? So that's in feet. So this displacement is measured in feet. You got that written somewhere right up here. These are all foot displacements. So I'm going to write that sideways. We pick up a dimension off our integral, and it's going to be feet, because we're integrating across feet. So feet, feet cancel, and we get some foot times, oops, natural log, foot times LB. So these are foot pounds, are these units. Now, I'm not a physicist, but foot pounds are a pretty common unit to do something with. So if you're taking a physics class, anybody taking a physics class that can explain foot pounds? What's that? Metric. Pounds are weird because they're not a mass. They're a mg, a mass times gravity, something like that. So these feet cancel out, 
but you pick up another foot uh, measurement. Or another way to think about it, how do we measure the width of dx? That's also feet. So you could think of it the feet, you could think of the feet being attached to the dx measurement. So the other two feet cancel, but you still have a foot left over. All right, so our final units are foot pounds. I don't usually care about units, so I just am doing this so if you go into physics or chemistry and you're using calculus and you're wondering why your units aren't matching, it's because you pick up an invisible dimension. So it's not really invisible, but it's the dimension you're measuring the axis you're traversing. All right, so we got one half and the units are foot pounds. So I'm only going to ask you two types of work problems. One of them is a hook law of springs. So I recommend you put hook's law on your cheat sheet. So I'll put a box around it. You don't need to write out the whole law. If you use it enough, you probably just need f equals kx. Uh, and you'll need the work function as well. So there's hook's law right there. The other type is where you're going to carry or move an object and also, it'll usually be counting the amount of weight of the rope or whatever uh, chain, whatever you're using to pick that object up. So this is the other type. And we'll do an example here. So a five pound bucket is lifted 20 feet. So this rope weighs 0 0.08 pounds per foot. So how much work is required to lift the bucket? So the only time I really noticed, well, if you lift weights, some people put chains on the end of the bar so it has a different weight. The further up it goes, it gets more weight. That would be one instance where I've seen people use this. Um, but if you ever climb up a ladder with a hose that's turned on, it's, the hose isn't terribly heavy until you're lifting like 20 or 30 feet of hose filled with water and at some point it starts to get very heavy. So that's an example of where if you have two people, you'd probably carry up an empty hose and then turn it on once you're already up there so you're not climbing the ladder with the hose and carrying all that water up. Um, that's another example. It gets surprisingly heavy pretty quickly, especially when you're trying to balance on a ladder. Uh, so we want to lift this bucket. Let's draw a picture. So we need to lift it some vertical distance. What's that? Oh, if I have to carry a ro uh, hose up a ladder, I just usually just carry it in my hand and climb up one-handed. It's probably not smart, but... No, no, no. Oh, in this problem? <laughs> oh! So if we use a pulley, we would... Well, you probably need more than 20 feet of rope because you need to go up and back down. Uh, so if you, you could set it up like that, but we're going to be pulling it up from the top, so not using any type of mechanical system. So we'll be... Treating it like a frictionless pulley. So there's our bucket and our rope will just go, oh, it looks like an arrow. There's our bucket of water and our rope is going to just be 20 feet long. And we're just gonna pull it up and whatever rope we've already pulled up, we won't count that weight at all. So our, we're pulling less rope the further up the bucket has moved, basically. This is, the way I set up will be a DY, yeah. So let's go ahead and draw this where the bucket is part way up instead of at the bottom or top. So 
So I will use a variable y for the height of the bucket. So we're assuming the person or the uh, machine pulling it up is at the top, not at the bottom with some pulley. So we have to carry this much rope. And also the weight of the bucket. So we need a f of y function, which is the force. Force needed at height y. So no matter what, you have to lift five pounds to get your bucket. The other thing you have to do, plus the rope. So we have to add how much rope that we're actually, what's the weight of the rope? I should probably write weight of rope. So how much does the rope weigh? So definitely 0 0.08 per foot. But what do I multiply this by? And one way physicists do this, they do it what's called unit analysis. So we got to lift five pounds plus some more pounds. So just looking at units, it's going to need to be multiplied by some feet. So the question is, how many feet do I multiply by? Y. So does Y work? So if we look at our graph here, does y measure the amount of rope? Yeah. What does y actually measure? Y measures this right here. So y measures the amount of not rope. How do I get the amount of rope? 20 minus y. 20 minus y. So you want total distance minus how much you traveled. That's how much rope you got. So at the beginning, you got 20 feet of rope, and then at the end you'll have zero. So we got 20 minus y. And if you're obsessed with keeping your units, you should put it in parentheses, because it's 20 feet minus y feet, not 20 whatever's minus y feet. So I'm going to stop writing all the units, because that's very annoying. So I'm just going to write the numbers. Uh, eight one hundredths. Now we'll just leave it in decimals. All right, so that is how much force at every different y uh, value that we have. And all we need to do is integrate. Here we have fy, so I need dy. What is my initial y value? So we got zero, and we're going up to 20 at the top. So we're measuring from the bottom of the bucket? Uh, we're treating the bucket as if it was a single point, basically. Okay. Uh, if I didn't do that, you would get into issues of where's the bucket starting. You probably measure, I guess you could say you measure from the bottom of the bucket. Um, and then you wait till the bottom of the bucket hit the top. Now in real life, you also have to carry it. You don't just stop the problem and drop it, probably. You, you move it over a little bit, too. So there'd be a little more work to do once you lift it at 20 feet. So this is polynomial. Most of it's a constant. And you can integrate that without a problem. I think the book said. You should get 116. Now another thing you could do, you could compute the work to move the water, the bucket itself. I didn't say there was water in there. Uh, didn't say anything was in the bucket. But you can compute the bucket because that's constant. And then you can compute 
to just pull the rope up and add those two numbers together. So you don't have to compute it this way. You could go separately. The constant amount of work multiplied by distance, so five pounds times uh, 20 will be 100 to move the bucket itself. And then you compute the rope, which will come out to be the 16. So you can do them separate as well. Is that 11? Is that 106 or one pound? Oh, that is uh, the number of whatever units we're in. Units are separate. Okay, so that's 106. That's 116? Okay. Yeah. I'm saying units because it's, let's see, it's feet times pounds. I think it's foot pounds, but I don't want to write it down to be wrong. What was our last unit? Yeah, it should be foot pounds. What is the metric unit for work? Joules, which is, so if you're in the metric system, it's got to be something, it's got to be some distance, meters. Newton meters. Kilogram. Well, let's just. There's other units that people use. <laughs> so that's the end of chapter six.